Alright guys, I always like to start off a video where I'm talking about a subject and just show you that I'm actually doing what I'm talking about. So I wanted to show you guys, here are a group of three males and four female bettas in a 20 long breeder and they just were fed and this is as aggressive as it ever gets. So how am I able to keep these bettas like this? They show off and they establish territories, but they have really good fin quality. Look at them. They're getting along really well. We've got all sorts of bettas in here uh, as far as the placat body style goes. And there's enough room in a 20 long so that each of the three males can have their own space. Now ideally two males is probably better and if you're new at this one male and several females or a group of females is going to be even easier but it is completely possible to pack even more bettas than this in. I've had 40 breeders with up to 30 or 40 bettas especially juveniles together. So let's go over some of the best practices and some of the info that is going to assure that your bettas are active, happy, and healthy, and that they're not actually hurting each other or super stressed out. Hey everyone, welcome to The Secret History, Living in Your Aquarium. And today we're gonna to be talking about keeping multiple bettas together. Not just female bettas in a sorority uh, or baby juvenile fry, but actual adult bettas together in captivity. Now. I've been keeping bettas for over a decade, well over a decade, and breeding them for a decade, and I've noticed a lot of things about them that I could say, but some new science that has just recently been published and peer-reviewed by a whole bunch of academics around the world uh, is really telling us some new information about bettas that we never knew, and this information is extremely useful, and I want to go over that today. So if you're interested in where I got the information, the uh, sources will all be cited in the description as always and I hope this may change uh, your thoughts about how bettas should be kept because there's always been these myths of you know bettas should be kept alone or maybe just one betta in a community tank or only female bettas and there are very specific reasons and situations when that is true uh, and a lot of those things have a grain of truth but they're not always the case and so let's go over all of that information There's some brand new information just came out this month in the journal of uh, ichthyology so let's talk about that and I'll see you guys inside alright guys so when we're talking about science of fish there's some really useful stuff you can find out by looking at academic journals and articles other than just the pet keeping articles you find uh, on the first results in Google. So go to Google and type in the word scholar and you'll find a section called Google Scholar. In that is all peer-reviewed academic uh, university and uh, PhD research peer-reviewed articles. So this here is this newest thing that was just published. Uh, if you want to check it out, it's uh, on science.org. It was published in an ichthyology uh, journal and it was published uh, in Magazine of Science, which is a big deal. Uh, but they've looked at the genealogy of bettas from around the world, and there is a ton of info here. So if you want to take a deep dive, if you're into the genetics and the breeding, this is an awesome uh, resource that's available to the public right now as well. It may not be forever, but what it's saying here that's important to us today, and we'll come back to this picture in a moment, is that. Our betta splendens actually come from four or five different bettas in the wild. So historically, they were cross-breeding bettas within their own, the same genus or complex as uh, the betta splendens. So the Imbolus probably, and some of the other, maybe even the Machiensis, uh, and some of these others were actually bred in with betta splendens. So the betta splendens is not necessarily what we should compare our bettas in our tank to, but rather a mix of those. So if something affects all those fish, it will probably affect or be true in our betta splendens. But the interesting thing is now they've found that down this pathway, which has uh, clickable links and information into all these different uh, color morphs and fin morphs, is that the farther away from wild, so these are farther away from wild, where you get the really big fins and the color uh, really differentiated, 
And you can see these Nemos that I keep, uh, Koi Nemo placots or any placots really, uh, these are closer to the wild type. Now some of them are just uh, odd luck that this little blue one with a big fin happens to be so far away from the others. Um, but others are because they bred the red bettas for fighting. And they bred the red bettas because of something called, uh, let's pull this up, the uh, carotenoid trade-off. And um, we'll talk about that in a moment. But first, I want to show you one more resource. If you're uh, getting into bettas and breeding and you want some more info, uh, National Geographic did a great article on betta fish. And they've got a whole thing here uh, about everything you might want to know about the betta splendens. And what you want to look at are the key information points about any fish in the wild that we can glean that would be useful for keeping them. So if you want them to act like they do in the wild, well, replicate the wild. If you don't want them to act that way, stay away from those things. So here we can see that they're found mostly in stagnant ponds, fresh water, rice paddies, marshes, and slow moving streams. They're used to around 80 degrees Fahrenheit as an average. Colder water causes them to become lethargic. Uh, if it gets too cold, down in the 70 range, it can stop them from eating and make them more prone to disease and infection. But knowing that, it means that you can actually keep your bettas a little calmer by keeping the temperature in that 77 degree range rather than 82 or 83, whereas where they're spawning. Also, it says that, you know, they were selected for all the bright colors and breeding, but that the reds were the first ones selected because red is actually uh, associated with aggression. And I don't want to say these words because it'll flag the video, but people probably know that they're known as a blanking uh, fish and uh, or, or even a Siamese or Chinese uh, blanking fish. And saying those words will will bounce this video off, so we're not going to say it. But it also mentions that they use make bubble nests out of mucus. You can, um, you know, they build that with tannins and their own immune system. And females showing off causes them to build more. So you can actually manipulate some of these things by learning what their mating rituals are, learning what they do when they breed. And knowing, you know, okay, well, if they're building a nest, they're getting territorial. Okay, if they don't have the right things in the water, they can't build the nest, and then they aren't going to show off, uh, or they aren't quite ready. But you still want to keep them healthy enough. So that's an interesting article to read. It'll, it'll take you lots of places, lots of links. Uh, and another article that I want to bring up that people have kind of questioned about for a long time, and this all started in 07, and it's called uh, the carotenoid uh, trade-off hypothesis. And that is that betta were bred to be aggressive, to put, be put together, two males, and to basically uh, have an endurance struggle and see who would come out. Not necessarily to um, harm one another, but to kind of push each other around, tire each other out, stress each other out. And humans are the ones who encourage this for probably a thousand or more years. And they've associated the pigments of carotenoids, which are your reds, yellows, and oranges, as a very limiting factor in nature. So there isn't a whole lot of those, and there isn't a whole lot of food with those in the wild. So the males that were able to take over a territory and eat all the things with those carotenoids in them, and by the way, almond leaves and a lot of tannins also provide subtle amounts of carotenoids to your microflora, and fauna in the tank and then the bettas can you know eat the algae they can eat the little uh, seed shrimp and things and they're mostly going to be eating little crustaceans little worms things like that but they can get those carotenoids and they need them from the plants and from their diet so you need to be supplementing them however they found that in red bettas that they actually get more aggressive in blue bettas and wild color bettas, they actually improve their uh, their immune system. So they saw they saw instead that the immune system uh, of they they tried it out on impaired immune system bettas also and found that it helped them if they weren't red. If they were red, all these uh, color enhancing uh, elements 
happened to be in the in the red and yellow uh frame of of colors they happen to make things more aggressive and uh that is because of probably humans in the wild they don't notice that same thing they allocate in the wild beta splendens actually allocate their uh nutrients a little differently so back to this cool article we can see that the red bettas are closest to the ones that were domesticated first, closest to this wild entry point of domestication. And here we're getting like the aliens and the coppers, and they're probably being um, more heavily uh, mixed. That's not accounted for here, which of the beta species are here. This is just taking a survey of all the genes present in all the colors of bettas. But you can see that the the alien bettas down here, the copper and bronze bettas, and the and the uh, the types like that, they're farthest away from wild, and that means they had to go through that bottleneck of all the red, uh, the red bettas that we bred for so long as humans to be aggressive, and we encouraged that redness, and we bred them for that redness, which in turn made them more aggressive. So you can see though that. If you want a red or colorful beta in that spectrum, uh, yellows are still fairly close to the, the calmer wild gen genes, and so are uh, the kind of speckled ones like this, the koi, nemo, and placots. But the bigger the fins get, and the more color rings the fins have, uh, the more those bettas had to be bred through that red and crossbred back against that red. And here you can see what the base color is on those bettas. And you can see also uh, what pigment combinations are there. And a lot of that can give us hints to temperament. So, so basically, the shorter the fin and the more wild they look, probably the calmer temperament they're going to have other than those standard red bettas you see at all the big box stores, because those are just an early domestication, but they're still close to this period when they were being bred for aggression uh, back in Thailand and Malaysia for the last 400 to 1,000 years. Really, the last 50 to 100 years is when they've been bred for color, and that really paid no attention to temperament. Uh, and there's now a gene that they've found, specifically, um, they've, they've found out that there's a gene called BAS1, uh, uh, and that gene is associated with domestication. And so this gene actually makes the ratio of their eyeballs, let's pull this up a little closer, it actually makes their eyes closer uh closer to the tip of their nose and it makes their pupils bigger it makes their cranial crest nerves a little smaller up here in the placots and these kind whereas down here you get the longer uh faces kind of like the arowana there's a longer between the nose and the mouth is longer and that is the same thing that's associated in dogs. Dogs and cats that have been domesticated have bigger eyes, bigger ears, ratio-wise. And it's the same exact gene, which is crazy because these are fish. So we have clearly domesticated bettas. And that information is all really helpful. So let's get back to the aquarium with all this knowledge in hand and talk about what we can do to reduce the stress levels and, and increase the cooperation and peaceful community feeling within a group of bettas. All right, so let's put all of this information together and talk about how you can keep bettas in a community now that we know that background. So in the wild, they're in these little stagnant rice paddies, and these rice paddies are very dense with vegetation. So we want to replicate that in our tank. Over here, we've got a blue female, a little colorful female. Uh, we've got a male here, another female here, a male here, and a female over there, and they each have enough room for territory. So in another article that was linked in this genetic article talking about the carotenoid ag aggression, it talked about how 
the bettas that were those red hues would use the carotenoids because it showed the females they had the red. They had that color uh, pigment available in their diet, which meant their babies wouldn't necessarily be red, but they would be... Um, they would have healthy immune systems because that red color, that carotenoid uh, complex, things like lycopene, are related to things like their slime coat health and their immunity overall. And so you can actually learn a lot about their um, colors and what in helps increase their colors with the carotenoids being the reds, uh, anthocyanins being the blue, and so forth. But the red was selected for aggression over the years. Now, in the wild, bettas pick a territory and they flare their gills and they make faces and they show their fins off. So the bigger the fin, this is the biggest fin I ever get in my tanks because the bigger the fin, the bigger the chance of misreading because they show it off like a flag and they show it off to say, this is my spot, this is my corner. And in the wild, they found that most bettas needed two and a half or three body lengths of territory around them in all directions. And that they wouldn't actually attack and hurt other fish, like rip their fins or anything, if they had that. So each of these corners, with enough block lines of sight by using things like lilies, like uh, large Amazon swords... And then breaking up the patterns, because these guys have some crazy patterns. The, the um, Placots and the Galaxies and the Nemos have some really interesting patterns. But you can break that up with some fine leaves. So things like Hornwort, Sawasertang, um, Guppy Grass. And it can't just be slightly planted. You need it really planted. And if you do that, you can stop them from being able to see each other. So he can't see the male that's over here across the tank. There's too much stuff in the way. Nor can this one in this corner even see this one over here when it's set up properly. So the more fish you have in there, the more things you need in the way because they're going to flare and show off, especially if they're feeding. I like to watch how they're getting along, especially if I'm adding new ones. If I've added new ones, I want to make sure I do it one, when it's dark. I dim the tank as much as possible, either the blue light setting or turn it off altogether, and let them settle in because there's already a kind of dominance hierarchy. They already know who the biggest, toughest male is. Usually after a month or two, they'll have sorted that out completely. But I want you to see that their fins, they're not all ripped apart. These guys all have good, healthy fins, but they all have shorter fins. And that what you're seeing there, like then, that was a false start charge as they call it in the biology uh, papers that have studied this so they want to scare each other they don't want to rip each other apart that's not good evolutionarily for a, a population that's cut off and isolated it could be limited especially across the genders but if they're put in a tiny tank together they will rip each other apart there's nothing to keep them apart from each other and also they get bored which is where these other fish come in, these dither fish. You definitely want some small, fast fish, maybe some pencil fish, some uh, hatchet danios or pseudomagills or tetras, rasboras, something like that, that's going to keep them apart from one another. Danios are great, and you want them to be small enough that they're not a threat to the bettas whatsoever, that they don't intimidate them and raise their anger. And the other thing is... Bettas are pretty inquisitive. They're pretty smart fish, and so they actually are going to be looking around and looking for threats. If all the little fish are calm, then the bettas know there's no big dangerous fish around. And if you pick fish that are small enough that they're afraid of the bettas, then when they're calm, they know there's not even any bettas around. And if those little fish can't see the bettas because of all the plants, it works out a lot better. So having that diversity of fish that take up different spots in the water column, because bettas are usually going to be either way up top or way on the bottom, uh, helps. Also, knowing your betta. Sometimes you just get a mean son of a gun. He got all the mean genes, and he's not going to work out, or she's not going to work out. And so that's a very real possibility that you have to keep in mind and observe. You need to learn how these fish act and, and how they behave and know what is just uh, fin and gill flaring that's within the normal uh, behavior 
versus what's a fight about to start. So beyond that, let's talk about the water quality in the tank. So the other thing you can do is you can keep the water quality still tropical and heated, but closer to 75 to 78 in that range. And that will keep them a lot calmer botanicals in the water that will keep their immune systems good it's things like almond leaves catapa leaves putting those in and allowing them to have a little bit of that at least will really help and feeding them good uh whole foods live foods one that will keep them distracted and get their energy out get their a, any aggression out uh so they're not just bored and picking fights and two it will help them be busy exploring little corners and other spots in the tank rather than looking for a female or looking for other fish to bug. Now, these fish in the wild, they uh, naturally, they pick up their territory and then the females kind of do more traveling than the males generally. And in this tank, this male is kind of king. He's got the biggest uh, fins as well. And like I said, that's as big of fins as I've ever had in this tank with them. Even though I've kept up to 40 bettas, especially when they're related, they're much, much less likely to be aggressive. So you can keep uh, a few dozen bettas in like a 40 breeder uh, if you've got it well planted and their siblings growing up together. However, once they reach maturity, it's generally better to get that density down to about one beta per, per cubic feet, one male. And, uh, m you know, the more room, the better, ideally. But you can judge depending on your needs and what you want to do uh, as your skill grows as a fish keeper. But for every one male, I like to have two or even three females, ideally. Then what I do is I make sure I have other tanks and I have breakaway tanks and in here, I've got a tank for the male and the female. If I see one of the males starting a nest, starting bubble making, uh, I will make sure that I keep an eye on him. And if he starts getting more aggressive, I will take him out and I will put him in here and I'll put one of the females, whoever he was hanging out with the most the last few days, I'll put her next door and let him build a nest. Then I'll move her in once he's got the nest made keep them together for a night or two until they lay eggs and then I'll move her out because he's going to get really angry. And the other thing that's important to know, uh, in here by the way, we've got baby fry from bettas growing out. I like to do that in my shrimp tanks because they eat all the pest uh, planaria and other little, little uh, critters that live in fish tanks if there's no fish, uh, that is shrimp tanks or snail tanks. Uh, yet they're too small to eat the uh, to eat the actual shrimp or do any damage to them right now. So we've got about 30 baby fry uh, betta in there right now from this guy right here actually and from this gal right here. And it looks like she's getting uh, a big belly which means she may be ready to spawn again soon. So things like that you learn to keep an eye on. When is her belly all big and full of eggs? She might be more temperamental. She might be traveling more looking for a mate. And the last thing is going to be uh, talking about water parameters. In the dry season, they wait in these puddles and ponds and rice paddies, and their water gets lower and lower. Wild uh, bettas uh, tend to actually uh, hide in flooded forests before rice paddies were cleared as much or in river deltas like reeded, reedy marshes and streams. And uh, they would just hang out and they wait because some get stranded and don't make it during the dry season. So they wait for that pressure to go from high pressure and really hot days in the summer to all of a sudden it cools down. The total dissolved solids goes way down because the water's been diluted and the temperature of the water drops. The air temperature outside goes up and the pressure drops outside. And that is what triggers them to think, our little puddle's gonna turn into a raging river and connect, and I need to have my babies big enough to survive that when those things connect in a couple weeks, those babies can start swimming out. So it's the start of that monsoon season or that wet season that those uh, isolated puddles then start connecting up and that bettas start really getting active and breeding. And so you wanna try to mimic that if you're trying to breed them, but if you want them to be peaceful, stay away from those conditions. 
And if you do these things, you can really help eliminate a lot of the aggression. Lastly, I want to mention a couple last things, which is when you feed them, watch them for quite a while to make sure everybody's settling in peacefully. Try to feed, you know, one up over here, one here, one here. And giving them quality live foods uh, with those carotenoids is fine, especially if you don't have red fish. Now, I'm pushing it a bit with more red colors in these fish, and they have a good diet, so the reds are showing a lot more. When I got these fish, they were a lot more yellow and orange, but that diet of carotenoids has really increased their color. But keep an eye on that, and also you want to make sure that your, your uh, sides of your tanks or any tanks next door, that they're not too reflective so that the bettas aren't seeing an angry male that is themselves all day and flexing on themselves in an endless circle of frustration. Also, the last thing I want to say is that water changes get those hormones, the testosterone, the cortisol, which is a stress hormone, out of the water. Those things build up in a fish tank and fish, just like humans and, you know, roid rage or menopause, estrogen, testosterone, cortisol, uh, uh, all those kind of things can build up and they give different signals to all living creatures and fish are very sensitive to those. So if you keep the water near neutral rather than really acidic, which it is right before they spawn, uh, and you keep that TDS more dissolved and you keep the water a little cooler, you're gonna have a lot more relaxed bettas. But again, feeding time like now is gonna be the time when they're gonna be the most active and aggressive and when you wanna keep an eye on what they're doing and if they're traveling way outside of their ranges, and if you need to move some things, change those lines of sight so that this betta can't see the bettas here, and those bettas can't see you know, the bettas in the middle either. And with all that put together, then you can really uh, expect to have them feel like they can retreat when they're outnumbered, they won't get too stressed, they can hide down low, and if you see one getting really discolored, all their colors going away, or they have fins that are ripped or nipped, then take that betta out. Put it in its own tank or its own, it can be in a small container, but put it on its own for a while, and maybe a two and a half gallon or you know whatever size tank you want to keep it in. That's up to you and your ethics. But again, I've got newly hatched fry right up here from these guys, and now they've just been reintroduced back to the group. And that's why this guy is showing off and uh, flaring up a little extra. And he's showing off for that egg-laden female a whole lot. So these two will probably pair off again soon. But I hope you guys enjoyed this content. I hope it was a little bit eye-opening even for long-term keepers and for new keepers alike. And if you like this kind of scientific, uh, evidence-based, as well as experience-based uh, video style, subscribe, become a member. I put all my sources and research uh, on the community page for only a buck ninety nine. You can get all those sources, and then I usually link for all my public videos just in the description. So I really appreciate you guys coming by. Hope you guys have a great day, and I'll talk to you next time on the secret history of living inside your aquarium. Have a good one, guys.